Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I am the Aniyawea Community Program Coordinator for the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. And part of what I do is uh, has been putting together this lecture series. And the first series is the winter lecture series, which, which focuses on cultural and language preservation and revitalization. And today we have uh, Miss Cherokee Tyramaney, who will be talking about her platform to help kick this off. Um, throughout the series, we will have various uh, artists from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians, as well as the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and the United Kituwa Band. Um, on the on the above the chat screen, you will see like the different options on top. We have a Q&A, which is the speech bubbles, one with a Q and one with an A. We encourage everyone to ask questions of Miss Cherokee uh, because that's how we're all going to to learn. But for now, I'm going to leave this to Tyra and I will be moderating the chat and uh, the Q&A section. Thank you, everyone. Shiana got a Tyra Mani Dagodo a Toshko Hishki Iagwa de Tianda Nole Iluodi de Guenasha. Chrissy Mani Heron Agitsi Nole Samuel Awa Jr. Agidoda Timothy Swaney Talene Agidoda. Hello everyone, my name is Tyra Mani. I'm 25 years old and I'm from the Yellow Hill community here in Cherokee, North Carolina. My parents are Chrissy Mani Heron, Samuel Awa Jr., and Timothy Swaney. And I'm the 2021-2022 Miss Cherokee for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, I just want to say thank you to Jen for inviting me to be a guest speaker for this panel. And um, so for those of you who might not be aware, um, that first part of my introduction, that was in um, our native language. That was in Cherokee. And um, so currently... The Cherokee language, especially for the Eastern Band, um, is currently endangered. Uh, we have less than 200 fluent speakers within our community, and we have between 16 and 17,000 enrolled members. So less than 1% of our population is actually fluent within our native language. And a lot of that is due to effects of uh, colonization and um, a lot of basically from like the US government and a lot of like the boarding schools and different things like that that they had implemented. Um, I kind of want to talk about the language first and I want to break down um, my introduction for you guys. There's, there's a lot of things that we can do to help preserve the language and whether like you know like one word or two words like the more that you're able to speak and the more comfortable you get with speaking the language. Um, that's what's going to help preserve our language for future generations. And that's something that I know I always like to focus on. Um, I usually like to, I like to think about focusing on seven generations back and then seven generations ahead. And a lot of that um, comes from like honoring the past, like honoring those that came before me. And then thinking about like everything that I'm doing as a way to preserve our culture and preserve our heritage for all of those Cherokees that aren't here yet and that are going to be here in the future generations. So the beginning of my introduction, um, shio is how we say hello in our language. Um, that's a really simple one that I know a lot of people like to use. Um, and then the nagada, that's basically, that's addressing everyone and that's like a way to say everyone. So like shio nagada would be a way to say hello everyone. I know most of the time, like, when we have, like, meetings or, like, any sort of, like, group activities, like, that's something that I know a lot of people in this community like to use. And then um, when I said Tyramani Dagwadoa, that Dagwadoa, that's, um, that's basically saying, like, my name is or, like, this is what I'm called. And it translates to, um, like, what I'm called more than once. And so that was how we referred to, like, what our names were like pre-contact um and then the 
the easy part would be like the numbers. So like that Tosh Quo, uh, that's how you would say 20. And then um, the Hishki is five. So I'm 25. And then Iago de Tianda, that's how you uh, address like how old you are. And then Elo Wodi is how you would say Yellow Hill, like within our community. And Deguena Shun, um, there's a couple different ways to say where you're from. Um, but I use Deguena Shun because that translates to my home. And I'm very proud to be from the Yellow Hill community. And so um, I like to, instead of saying like I'm from Yellow Hill, I like to say like my home is Yellow Hill because I'm really um, connected there. And like that's where I'm from. That's where my like I grew up with like my mom and um, I'm very proud to be from that community. Some other ways that you could say that is like Geha and that's basically like I'm from there. Uh, but to me, like saying like the Guaynashan, like it hits like a little closer to home to me. Um, Agitzi is how I would say like my mom. And then if you're talking to your mother, Aitzi is another way that you can like address her. Um, Agidoda is my father, or like I've heard some people like when they're talking to their father, like they would say Doda. And then, um, so those are just like some simple like Cherokee words that you can use. Um, I've been working at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian for almost eight or nine years now. Um, I started working here when I was in high school. Um, I was a gift shop clerk and then I became a box office worker. I was selling tickets. And then I actually joined the Adzila Anatoshki Cultural Specialist Program. Um, at the time, we were known as the Cherokee Friends. And we went through a rebranding. And we wanted to incorporate the language in the name of our group. And Adzila Anatoshki is how you would say fire builders and so we use that as a metaphor like for our group um we're known as like the fire people and this fire that like we're talking about like in our name that's like who we are as like Cherokee people and that's like our culture and we use it as like a metaphor because we want to like add to that fire and we want to build it up and we like the bigger that fire is um the more that it's gonna preserve and last for future generations like I had mentioned before um and during my time like with the cultural specialist program here um I did like a lot of research on like the history of just Cherokees like in general and then I started to kind of like focus um I took certain topics to focus on the first thing that I started to focus on was uh Cherokee basketry I'd always thought our baskets were beautiful and um, just like the different like patterns, the dyes that you could use for those things. So I focused on basketry first and then after basketry, I started researching a lot of like women and gender roles um, because prior to contact, like our women were, um, our women were very, powerful and we were considered like a matrilineal society and after contact a lot of those gender roles they kind of started to change like due to colonization and so what I focused on was those gender roles like at the beginning of contact and how like even just after like 200 years of contact between the 1500s and the 1700s like how much all of that had changed and then um, there's like a lot of things that based on those like primary sources that our people, we don't like, we kind of lost those things like based on what was written in those accounts. And they might have, they might not have like accurately described what was going on, but just using like context clues, like there was like a lot of cool things that it documented that we did that we just don't do now. And so that was another interest of mine. And then uh, tattoos has always been an interest of mine. And so I started looking up um, a lot of like traditional practices, like with Southeastern tribes. And then um, JP Johnson, um, he is Cherokee Nation. And he actually has um, 
a lecture about southeastern tattooing and Cherokee tattooing. Um, I highly recommend looking that up. It's on YouTube. Uh, but I learned a lot of information from him. And then there were just like various books and primary sources that I had learned um, about the tattooing process that really interest me. And they were um, a lot of things that I was like working on learning more information about. And I remember trying to tell like as many people as possible. So whenever it came to actually becoming like running for the Miss Cherokee pageant, um, I think from working here at the museum and learning a lot of those things, that's actually what helped me like really hone my skills, like when it came to running. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, the Miss Cherokee pageant, we have royalty pageants every year. Um, we have the Miss Cherokee, which is um, 18 to 25, and they have to be enrolled within the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. We have Teen Miss, which is 17 to 14. We have Junior Miss, which is 12 to 10. And then we have Little Miss, which is six to nine year olds. So every year, um, usually during our fair, which is like the first week in October, we hold these pageants. And what's different about these pageants than any other pageant is that these are very like culturally based pageants. And I know there's a lot of other tribes like in the United States and even in Canada that hold these pageants. But mainly what these pageants do is it's a way for you to basically be proud of like who you are and like be proud of like your culture and your tribe. And um, once you like win that title, you actually act as like an ambassador for that tribe and you are representative for your community and um, for everyone like from your tribe. And so that was one of the things that I thought would be like really cool about running. And um, I actually planned to run last year, but because of COVID, um, the reigning royalty, they actually ended up uh, reigning for two years. So I had about a year to prepare for my pageant. And um, I did like a lot of like historical research and I tied a lot of that into the pageants, the pageant itself. And so the beginning part of like our pageant is you are required to introduce yourself in the native language, which is like what I did with this um, lecture series. And then uh, you also have a platform that you talk about. Um, it's basically like, it's either like an awareness or like a cause that you want to promote like within your community uh, during your reign. And so the, what I focused on was cultural revitalization and from working at the museum um, and being around like a lot of those historical documents and then even like seeing like the archives that we have, um, it was kind of, um, it was very like emotional for me. And you're just seeing like these things or you're hearing these like accounts of like our ancestors from like, a hundred years ago, like 200 years ago, like 300 years ago and so on. And, um, that was something that I was really passionate about. And then learning about like all of the things that we used to do as Cherokee people that we don't do now. And then kind of learning like the effects that led up to why we are in the state that we are currently. Um, it was like something that like, I was very passionate about. And so um, I decided to run with the platform of cultural revitalization. And a lot of this, back, actually like pretty much all of it can be um, traced back to basically like contact and colonization. And so we've been under the effects of contact and colonization pretty much since almost 500 years um, around the late 1530s and like the early part of the 1540s was um, our first documented contact, which was with the Spanish. Um, Hernando de Soto and a group of uh, Spanish explorers had basically came up to the like the southeast of the United States um, after they found like a bunch of like gold and like riches from like Peru and like different parts of South America. 
they had journeyed up to North America and they first came through Florida and they had like contact with like the Seminole and like the Miccosukee and different tribes like that. So it was about probably between like 1539, 1540 was the first time that they had contact with the Cherokee and they talked about coming through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so that was our first contact. And then we had contact with the British and the French and that was probably like the biggest effect on our people today. Um, so the Cherokee, we believe in balance and like we, there's a lot of like balance. It's like the center of like our spirituality. And so like the day balances the night, um, women balance the men, um, things like that. And we believe in not taking more than what is needed because it's going to throw off that balance. And so traditionally, um, we never saw ourselves as being like above anyone else. Um, we believed that we were like living creatures and that we had the same, we believed that we had like the same purpose and the same like importance as the plants. And we saw ourselves as being like the same as the animals as well. And so because of that balance that we had, one of the things that we did is like, if we had to like kill an animal for food, what we did is like, we would, we had these social dances that we did and those social dances, um, basically we would perform those dances before a hunt. Um, like if we were going to hunt a bear, we would do the bear dance before that hunt. And in that dance, the dancers, they mimic like the bear, like usually like they have like their paws up and they're kind of like pawing around. And then like in certain parts of the song, like you're like, you act like you're like hunting like berries and stuff like to hibernate for the winter. And so we would do that dance um, before a hunt. And that was like our way of giving thanks to the creator for that animal. And we, cause our dances were very like ceremonial, like for us. And so when we did that dance, we would like pray for a good hunt and we would pray uh, like to give thanks to the creator for that animal. And then if the hunt was successful, we would also perform that dance afterwards. And we were thanking that animal for like taking it. So because we took its life so we could continue ours. And so we also believed in like never taking more than what we needed. And so when it came to doing like these dances, um, we would only like, we would get like one bear and then we would divide out like all the meat and stuff for like everyone that it could feed like within the community. Uh, we would use the, we would use its fur for like our clothing. We would make leather to for clothing as well. Um, bones we could use for different tools. Uh, we would also use like the claws and stuff for like tools, decoration, jewelry different things like that. So we used every part of that animal when we took it. And then once the, once the British came here and we established a, a kind of like a, I guess a trade, like we became partners with the British. Um, they saw like us using like bows and arrows and they saw ways that we were killing these animals that were more, that was, more successful than like them using their guns because they were loud and they would often scare like the animals away. And so we would trade with the British. We would actually, we would like go hunt deer and then we would turn in like those hides or like the deer meat and stuff. And then we would, um, we would trade for like clothing, um, jewelry, different things like that. Um, the dress I'm wearing, you can't tell it's a dress, but, um, this is actually like an 18th century style chemise. Um, the British women would have worn this as like an undergarment or they would have worn it as like a nightgown. Um, but with the Cherokee, we didn't, we didn't have a problem with like nudity or like being like modest. So like we just wore this as like our everyday clothes, whereas they thought that we were super, it was super revealing. But so like this would have been something that we would have traded for um, but in time of trading, 
we actually, uh, the British actually took advantage of that. So if we wanted to trade for like a musket, um, if the musket was five feet tall, then we had to turn in a pile of deer hides that were five feet tall. And so because we were doing that, we actually depleted a lot of our resources. And um, so not only did the British and then even the Spanish, uh, not only did they bring like sickness and disease into our community, but because we were depleting so much of our food sources, um, a large portion of like our people actually ended up dying from starvation. And it was just because of like all those resources that we had depleted. And then um, there was treaties that were put in place from the like King George the Third that prevented a lot of those settlers from like encroaching on Cherokee territory, but they did it anyway. And so that loss of land also started to come with that. And then even from like legal standpoints, like we had like treaties with the British, we had treaties with the French, we had treaties with the United States government. And a lot of those treaties, um, a lot of those treaties were broken and we might have remained true on our side, but on their side, um, they broke like a lot of promises. And so because of that, it kind of, that starts to lead into like that colonization. So not only were our people getting wiped out by diseases and different sicknesses, um, we are also just depleting a lot of our resources and then loss of land. Um, that all plays a factor into um, how a lot of our people were dying and then um, just being like colonized. So after the American Revolution, um, a lot of people like to only blame like Andrew Jackson for um, like the removal, but it actually, it started before that. Like it basically started with contact and even with uh, Washington, um, his presidency, he implemented the civilization policy. And during that civilization policy, um, they wanted us to stop living in communities because when we lived in communities, um, we lived off the land. Like we didn't have like animals caged in. Like if we needed meat or we needed food, like we would go and hunt that as we needed it. And then like, um, the United, the Appalachian part of the United States, which is where we are located. Um, it's known as like the seed cradle of the entire United States, like 95% of like plants that grow within the United States grow within the seed cradle. So we had an abundance of like plants that we could eat for food. And so once this civilization policy came about, um, Basically, they wanted us to mirror the lives of, like, the white Americans that were living here at that time. So, hypothetically, like, if there was a Cherokee family, um, it was basically like, okay, well, you live in this village, but instead you're going to get this plot of land, and then you're going to get, like, one acre for your garden, and here's a piece of livestock. And so that's kind of where that colonization started. So we started to abandon like those communal ways that we had always, we had always um, like lived like for hundreds of years at that point. And then even after, um, and then so even from basically putting like a family here and then like, here's your livestock and here's your garden. Um, a lot of like the knowledge of like traditional like hunting and then like even how to like gather like different plants like a lot of that knowledge started to be lost just because we didn't need it like we had a garden and like we had livestock so it's like okay well that's that's all we need and we don't have to hunt anymore so then like when those kids grew up they were like well this is how my family was raised so then they didn't grow up learning how to like hunt or like gather like berries and different plants like that and and then um pretty much like all through the like united states like presidencies like there was just like little like trees or like 
little things that had happened where it was like there was land loss there was um we had to like basically like adopt all of these ways as like the white americans and it actually wasn't until probably was it 1978 1979 um that was when the indian religious freedom act was passed so basically everything up until that point um what we were doing was considered um illegal like they were it was illegal practices so like those songs and those ceremonies that we were doing um it was often deemed as like um like devil worshiping and so in the eyes of a lot of like the white americans that were here they saw it as, from where they saw it as like devil worshiping and they saw it as like us being heathens um they implemented like this law it was like from the united states and so every traditional practice that we had like it was illegal and it wasn't until 78 or 79 that the religious freedom act was passed and up until that point or so it wasn't until then that we were able to like freely practice like a lot of our ceremonies and a lot of our cultures um and then even during the trail of tears like a lot of the land that we had lost and even being removed out to oklahoma like there were a lot of people there were like that had passed away just due to like the conditions that we were put in like along the way of the trail of tears and then um like sickness starvation um all of that and even after the trail of tears then basically henry pratt came along and he implemented the boarding schools and the boarding schools is definitely one of the most recent effects of colonization that um pretty much like every tribe like across the united states and canada has had to endure and basically like one of the most famous quotes from that time period was kill the indian save the man and um it was mainly used as a war tactic and so henry pratt was he was a i believe he was a war he was either like an attorney of war or he was like a war general but during that time he basically um he basically was like if we take their kids and we put them in these boarding schools then the parents are going to do what we say and so it was like almost a way is like if we need you for this war then like you're going to come with us because we have your kids in these boarding schools so that was used as like a war tactic like against a lot of um a lot of like tribes in the United States and in these boarding schools we were forbidden from speaking our language we were forbidden from practicing um many aspects of our culture we were forbidden from um like a lot of like our ceremonial and uh like spirituality type practices like all of that was forbidden and even uh recently like within this year like there's they've uncovered like mass graves all along, all along um Canada from where like a lot of these residential schools were at and even um the last boarding school didn't even close until 97 so it's something that's very recent and there's a lot of people like that's alive today that has been under the effects of this colonization um that's like my grandmother she's a fluent speaker and she was sent to a boarding school but because of all the things that happened to her at boarding school and just um it was basically like a form of like brainwashing almost like for our people like we were like just all the things that we were forbidden from being able to do and so like once you like come out of those boarding schools like it has like lifelong effects and i've seen a lot of that like firsthand um like after my grandma left the boarding school and then she like met my grandfather and they had a family like because of the effects of that boarding school in return she didn't teach my mother's generation and then because of that my mom was unable to teach me the language and so 
um, almost every like Cherokee, not just Cherokee, but almost every native family, um, they can find that like that breakage, like within their, um, their family history, like with me, like within one generation, like within my family, like the language was already lost. And so those are, um, some of the effects that has happened due to colonization. And so this cultural revitalization that I had as my platform, um, basically what it is, is like, this is like, I see it as an opportunity and a way for me to give back to people like within uh, the community here. And then hopefully um, either through like lectures like this or even through like virtual presentations, like I can give back to um, not just people who are here like within the community, but almost like anyone who's like willing to like listen and learn. Um, but some of the ideas that I have, um, which hopefully like those will start here soon. Um, but I want to start offering like workshops like within the community um, from working here at the museum. Um, I've learned how to wood carve. I know a little on how to finger weave, like how to make like the finger woven belts that we have. Um, I know how to make white oak baskets. Um, I've never made a river cane basket, but I know like the process of like gathering my materials and stuff. And I've made um, river cane mats, but I haven't made a basket yet. And um, I know about pottery. And then um, I also know like a lot of like about the history of these things. And so what I want to start doing, um, hopefully like in a COVID safe way is like, uh, giving back to the community and like offering like lectures and offering classes like for community members so they can learn these things and then hopefully like whether it be like their kid or their friend or like their mom then they can take what they learned like through those classes and then teach it to someone else and then hopefully like a lot of um, aspects of our culture that are at risk of being lost hopefully like the more people like currently that get interested in those things um it'll like almost like preserve it and then um it'll like kind of keep that fire going for the next generation of Cherokees um and so that's definitely what I want to focus on like with my platform and the part about like revitalization in from basically like after like all these years of like contact and colonization like we're never going to get to where we were pre-contact and like there's just like no way around it and so there's like new ways to like incorporate like some of these like ancient traditions or like ancient um like practices like in who we are today and i know like there's a lot of like native communities that talk about um like kind of like walking into a world so it's like on one hand it's like you know like I am like uh an American citizen and then like on that other hand like I am Cherokee and these are like the things that I can do to like honor that Cherokee side and then like basically like I live like everybody else like you know I drive a car and I like have like a normal job and I have like a house and things like that so it's like finding that balance and um that's like the fun part about like that revitalization is like well we can't do it like we did like 500 600 thousand years ago but there's ways that we can like honor the past and like implement those things and like find like new meanings or like new traditions and like new ways to like still honor who we are as Cherokees. Um, that's like, I mean, even today, like I use a, a white oak basket as like my purse and um, like, that's what they, like, I know a lot of people have baskets as like an art form and they like sit on their shelf and um, they are very pretty like display pieces, but I actually like to use my baskets and um, like that's like a modern like that's like 
a new way that like I'm taking like that old tradition and using it today. And even um, Jen, um, the community program coordinator, she um, like, these are like 18th century style designs and she cut them like out of a or out of acrylic with her laser engraver. And so this is like a new way that we're like honoring like some of those like old patterns, like, with like new forms of um with like new forms of technology and so that's just a little bit about my platform and about who i am and i'm gonna start answering some questions um i don't know if jen has any questions right away Okay, so this question, um, can you tell us about the Cherokee clan system and my clan and its roles? Um, so the Cherokee clan system, there's actually a traditional story that goes along with that clan system. And so um, the town is known as Gadua. Um, we're like actually very fortunate as a tribe to own the um, rights to the land there. And so, uh, like today, like we still own the rights to that land. And so, um, Gadua is like our mother town and that's where we believe as Cherokees we started. And like, that's where we originated from. And whenever we came out of Gadua, we had sent seven medicine leaders. We had sent them to the top of this mountain known as Kauai. And at that place, um, they fasted for seven days and seven nights. And on that seventh, after that seventh day, uh, the creator actually came to them. And what the creator did was brought them our clan system. They brought them our language and a lot of aspects of our culture and like how we, um, and like basically everything that was like the key points in creating our tribe. And because it was seven medicine leaders that we had sent, the creator assigned a clan to each one of them. And so for the Cherokee, our seven clans is, we have the deer clan, we have the bird clan, we have the wild potato clan, we have the wolf clan, the paint clan, the blue clan, and the long hair clan. And each one of those clans, um, they had a different role traditionally, like in our community, um, like the deer clan, like they were typically considered like the, like they were considered like fast runners and they were quick. And so when we had messengers, like we would send someone from the deer clan and they were known as our runners. And so we would send them to like the next village over, um, as a messenger. And then, um, like the long hair clan, like they were considered like very, um, like level headed and very uh, peaceful. So like a lot of our peace chiefs came from that clan. Um, and so traditionally um, we actually had two different chiefs and depending on like what our tribe was doing at that time, depended on which chief was in power. So we had a peace chief and then we had a war chief. And anytime we had to go to battle with like another tribe or like with like, Oh, against like the British and the French or like the Spanish or anything like that then our war chief was in charge and um, basically like they would they were the ones that created like the entire plan like that our um, like our townships and our villages and like our tribe would follow and then um, when we weren't in battle and when we weren't at war uh, that's when our peace chief was uh, in charge and so I just want to like touch base on that real quick since I mentioned the peace chief. Um, but our clan systems, um, as I had mentioned before, like uh, we are a matrilineal society. Um, our clan ships actually come from our mother. And so um, basically like if your mother was bird clan, then when you were born, you were considered bird clan. And then if you were a woman, and you had a kid, then those kids were uh, considered bird clan. So it follows it follows the mother's line, and then um, 
uh, talking about like those gender roles that we had um, when it came from you, whenever it came to like Cherokee, like a Cherokee man and woman getting married, um, the husband would actually, uh, he would actually take on the wife's clan. So instead of um, today where like more commonly, like the woman marries into the husband's family and she takes his name and, you know, he's like, man of the house or like head of the household kind of thing um traditionally for us it was actually the opposite and so um if you got married the husband moved into the wife's house it was considered her property the kids were considered her kids and um that clanship he got adopted into his wife's clan so he took on her clan and then all of their children took on the wife's clan and so that's kind of like the structure of the Cherokee clanship. Um, my clan though, um, I am actually from the One Walks Around clan of the Navajo Nation. Um, my mother's mother is, um, she's Navajo. And the clanship there works a similar way. So you actually have four clans with the Navajo. Um, but your main clan, it works the same as the Cherokee. So it um, it follows your mother's line. So my grandmother, like she was born into the One Walks Around clan. And then when she had my mother, my mother was born into that clan. And then once my mother had me, I was born into that clan. Um, but the One Walks Around clan of the Navajo, they were actually, um, it was, they were actually considered one of the four original clans. That the Navajo had, and we were gifted um, the we were gifted turquoise, and so we were the ones that gave turquoise to all of the other Navajo um, within um, our nation. And then we are also um, considered uh, a lot of like medicine people came from the One Walks Around clan. So those are actually the roles of my clan, and that's the clan that I come from. Um, Let's see. Let's see. So while researching women and gender roles at the museum, was there a primary source or account that really stuck with you or surprised you? Um, so this, oh my gosh, I just lost my ear. <laughs> It's funny. Um, so this actually is funny because anytime I think of women and gender roles, there is one account that like it just it always pops into my head and it's something that it sounds cool and I want to try it one day. Um, but it was from the I believe it was from the McDowell documents. Um, McDowell uh, the McDowell documents was basically like all of these like letters from the that basically went through the governor of South Carolina like during the 18th century and um, they're sometimes they're hard to read they're a little hard to decipher um, just like the like the verbiage that they use it's like kind of crazy um, but one of the accounts in that that has always stuck with me is that there was an account talking about how Cherokee women, we when we would like go and hunt deer like the men uh, typically like when they would hunt the deer and how i mentioned like we use every part of that like that animal like when we kill it um one of the things that we had did with this deer was we cut its all four of its legs off and we cut its head off and so it was just the body and what we did was we sewed up the holes like where we had cut its feet off so we had sewed that up and we created like a rawhide out of the body of that deer. And what we would do is like with the deer's like back, like against a tree. Um, and from where we had its head cut off, that was considered an opening. But we would sit that deer, like that rawhide from that deer against a tree. And we would let like sap or like honey from that, um, from like that tree or like the bee's nest or anything like that we would like sit it we would prop it up against that tree and we would just let it sit there so that sap or anything once it ran down it it collected in that deer hide and that was a way that we would 
collect like honey, um, any sort of sap. Um, but that account has always stuck with me because that was something that I had never heard of. I've never seen anyone do that. I've never even mentioned like no one's even mentioned like ever seeing like their mom or like even like their dad, their grandma, anything like that. And like no one's ever seen that before. So like that's something cool that I want to try one day just to see how it is. But that's um, that is the account that has just stuck with me since day one of doing my research for women and gender roles. Do you think the Cherokee will go back to their original cultural beliefs and away from the colonizers' religious beliefs? Um, I don't think as a tribe, uh, or like even like as a community, like I don't think that's something that we would do. I know there are some people that um, they still honor like that spiritual side of things and they still try to follow that spirituality. Um, and then I also know like some Cherokees that found that balance in their Cherokee, but they're also Christian or they're like Jewish or something like that. So I don't think as a tribe we'll ever get there, but I do know like there are people like within like our community that are like still um, putting in effort to preserve and learn, <laughs> preserve and uh, learn like those spiritual ways and those spiritual practices to follow. Will any of the language revitalization efforts be available online, video reels? I'd love to teach my four-year-old son Sequoia, but require resources. Your platform can reach so many. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Um, so there are like a couple different resources online and um, even like within our tribe, uh, we have the Gadua Academy. And so that's basically like an immersion school and starting from, um, when like kids are like babies, like six months old, basically up until sixth grade, um, they have students there and they have teachers there that, um, know the language and they teach like different like aspects of the language to these kids. And so that was one of the efforts that we had put in, um, as a tribe to help like the younger kids learn the language. And then we also have the call program and that's Cherokee adult language learners. That's what it stands for. And those are, that's actually like an immersion school for um, adults as well. So those are like some of the efforts that we're putting in. Um, I know there are a couple online resources. Um, I think the Academy, they actually have some on their like website. Um, I don't remember their website, but if you look up, Katua Academy, um, like Cherokee, North Carolina, and it's K-I-T-U-W-A-H. That's how you spell Gadua. Um, they should have resources on their website. And then also if you look up your if you look up your grandmother's Cherokee.com, I believe is what it is. Um, that's an online um, Cherokee language program that um, I've used it. Um, it personally, it helped me the best. Um, but there are like a couple of different resources. You just have to know like where to look. Um, hopefully after this, maybe I can pull some of those websites and we can post those like from the museums, like social media. But thank you for that question. What are some cultural practices that we as Cherokee people can incorporate into our daily lives? Um, so there's like a couple different things. Um, so I know like, um, um, so like some of the, like one of the things that I do is like, um, whenever I had first moved away, I, um, uh, I wasn't that far away. I'd moved to Atlanta, which is about three hours from here, but I had moved down to Atlanta for school. And I was just starting to get comfortable and like confident in like the things that I was learning, like in Cherokee. And I was worried that like from going to school down there and like not being around people to like speak with that I was going to like start to lose everything that I had like worked so hard to get towards. 
And so what I did was like, I found things from like my daily routine. And so like, I tried to incorporate the language like as much as possible in that. Like um, I had like little um, labels like by my toothbrush and it would like, I would like, as I was brushing my teeth, like in my head, I would say like, I am brushing my teeth like in Cherokee. And then there was one by like my soap. And it said, like, I'm washing my hands, I'm putting in my earrings, I'm taking off my glasses, I'm putting on my glasses, um, I'm getting out of bed. So those were, like, some of the, like, those were, like, with the language, that was some of the things that I was, like, incorporating, um, like, from a language perspective. And then um, from a cultural perspective, um, basically, like, what I was doing... um, it wasn't so much like always a daily thing, but I was um, like, I was trying to like learn a lot of like, not only like, um, not just like the crafts, like uh, basketry, pottery, wood carving, things like that. But I was going through and I was listening to like a lot of like um, storytellers, like on CD, like um, Freeman Owl has a really good CD. Um, Kathy Littlejohn has a really great CD. Um, Lloyd Arneach Sr., he has a great CD for, like, storytelling. And so, like, sometimes, like, I would listen to, like, those stories or I would, like, even read some of those stories. Um, There's a book by James Mooney that has a lot of Cherokee stories in that. And so I, um, I would read those stories, like, whenever I was bored or just when I had some downtime and a lot of those stories, um, people call them like, they call them like legends or they call them, um, they like, I don't know. They almost put like a negative connotation with it. Like it's like a fairy tale thing, but, um, a lot of those legends that we have and a lot of those stories, um, it actually talks about like the way a lot of things in our, a culture like originated or like how things came to be and so from like a spiritual standpoint like a lot of those stories like I refer back to because I'm like well this is what we were told and a lot of those stories um, in that James Mooney book were documented by Swimmer um, during the 19th century but before they were documented by like these um like ethnologists or like anthropologists um they were passed down like through oral tradition and so that's like how those things from like like that story i told about the medicine leaders going to kawahi like that's a story that has been passed down from generation to generation and has survived for like thousands of years and so um i always refer back to our stories when it comes to things that i'm like I want to know more about or I'm kind of stuck on and those stories give me context clues for like a lot of those like primary sources that I'm reading about but those are just like some of the things that I do and that help me um like in my day-to-day life has anyone from the EBCI considered running for office outside of tribal leadership Honestly, um, if there is, I cannot recall them, but, um, as of right now, I don't think so. Like, I think, um, a lot of those people that are, like, um, like, chief, vice chief, council members, I think the reason why, like, a lot of them are in those positions is, like, because, like, their focus is, like, here, like, within, like, our tribe and within our community, um, but at least not to my knowledge. I don't know of any that has tried to run for like a larger, um, a larger thing outside of uh, here. How has tourism had an effect on the chicken language and cultural practices? Um, so tourism actually did play like a big part in who we are as Cherokees and it, actually in some way it helped us at the time but it also um it also hindered us a little bit so around like the 40s and 50s um when it was like the height of popularity for like the 
Western movies and like all the John Wayne movies and things like that. Um, basically, um, Cherokee, like as a town, um, like our boundary was like very poor. Um, there wasn't a lot of work being done. And because of that, so what we started doing is we actually started catering to tourism. And so sometimes now, like even today, like if you Google like Cherokee, North Carolina, you will see headdresses, you will see teepees, um, you will see a lot of these things that are not traditionally Cherokee at all. Um, they're plains and none of that is anything similar to like what we practice as like a, a tribe or as a culture. And, but the reason we did that is because you saw all these like people portraying natives in these Western movies and they automatically had this like, they automatically had this idea in their head that every tribe in like across the United States and Canada is going to exact exact is going to act exactly like this. And because of that, and because tourism um, helps stimulate our economy, we catered to that. And we had people that was like chiefing around as we would say, and they would wear like the, like the headdresses and like the war bonnets. And they be like, come get your photo with an Indian for $5 or whatever. And, um, so that was an effect that um so that's an effect that tourism had on our people and just like from that it's like there's so many like negative like stereotypes and there's so many like negative like imagery that came from tourism and came from those movies um there's over like 550 federally recognized tribes in the united states and all of us are vastly different. We have our own language. We have our own um, belief system. We have our own culture, our own songs and dances. And uh, because of those movies, everyone um, kind of like homogenizes us like into this one like giant group when that couldn't be any further from the truth. And because of that and because that's what people wanted, we uh, started pandering to that around like the 40s and 50s. And so now um, we're doing like a lot of work to um, kind of like educate people and tell them like, no, that's not who we are. And this is actually like who we are as like Cherokee people. How is the EBCI stepping away from these stereotypes and practices? Um, so there's actually like a couple different groups um, within the Eastern Band that are like helping with these efforts. Um, here at the museum, um, our cultural specialists help with that all the time. Um, they wear like the 18th century clothing like I do, and they demonstrate a lot of like traditional crafts. They do a lot of like community outreach and like educational programming not just like within our community but within like surrounding communities and they go to like different like schools and different events but their like main thing is to like educate like about who we are as Cherokees and um a lot of that does come with um kind of like in a nice way telling people that everything they thought about Cherokees is more than likely wrong and um so it's not always easy but it's something that like has to be done um i know there's like uh, a lot of different um groups within the community that do that i know um the um i know like the um like they're like at the acad at the language academy that i mentioned they have little kids that are in like dance groups and then even like students at um Cherokee Central Schools like they do presentations and things like that um and then like just people like in our day-to-day -day lives like um if someone like asks um like a derogatory question or makes like a derogatory statement like I know there's a lot of people like in this community that's kind of like that's not okay and that's actually wrong and this is like why and um so there is like some efforts to like dispel those stereotypes just because there's so many and um it's like very like harmful for like native communities um and then like um it's yeah it's just a lot of work but 
it's slowly but surely getting there. <laughs> what words of advice and encouragement would you have or give for the next generation of indigenous people that are aspiring to follow in your footsteps? So um, the one piece of advice that I get that I want to give to like um, not even like those that like not even like this next generation but even people like in this generation that are here now or even like people who are like my like predecessors or people who are like older than me anything like that um, the one thing that I highly encourage is to be yourself um, I know that sounds cheesy and you've probably heard it like a million times but it's um like every little thing about you is like what makes you unique and what makes you you um i know there's sometimes that i kind of like code switch because like i kind of have like a i guess like or like not so much a reservation accent i don't know how to describe it but like there's a lot of like native slang and like there's a lot of like uh like Cherokee verbiage that I use and um I know like for a long time like when it came to like my friends who like weren't Cherokee um like I would code switch because I was like well I don't feel like having to tell them what this means or like I don't want them to like make fun of me and I know like um at one point like you know like I just like I didn't really like it's not that I didn't want to be Cherokee, but I didn't want people to know that I was Cherokee. I didn't want people to know I was native because it, it almost seemed like, um, like, I don't know. I didn't want to be different, I guess. It's like, I didn't want to like stick out, but now, um, I, uh, now I like highly encourage you to be yourself. Um, I, I love wearing a lot of like our traditional, like, earrings i love wearing beadwork with like traditional patterns um i like dressing in like my traditional clothes like there's sometimes like when i have to dress out for an event and like i'll just like wear it the whole day because it's like this is like from my culture and like i'm proud to be like from these people and like this is like a way that like i honor myself and like um this is a way that i'm proud to be like who I am and almost every day um, I wear my ZL which is um, a Navajo hairstyle I'm not wearing it today but um, from where my mom's side and like matrilineal matrilineally I'm Navajo like there are like little things that I do to like honor that but I highly encourage um, all native people and everyone else um, to like be yourself and be proud of who you are and be proud of where you came from and um also if you have like elders in your family or anything like that like I highly encourage you to like just talk to them like just listen like there's so much um like there's so much like about like who we are that I wish like I could have learned like from like my great-grandparents or uh like even my grandparents and um yeah there's just there's a lot of like answers there so i encourage you to just be yourself did you find any documents in your studies that supported that there were more genders than just the cis male and female genders do you know do you know how more genders would support the balance you discussed before um so i actually there actually was um an account it was from i cannot remember which primary source it came from um if i find that i can put that out there somewhere but um when looking at the women and gender roles um there was actually like a an account talking about how we actually had like trans uh, men and women in our community and then we also had people that didn't really like um fall into either one like they had like they had that balance of like like they weren't more masculine they weren't more feminine like they were just like right in the middle and um there were like primary sources um 
from I believe the 16th century that was talking about that and um, I do I do hope that um, like the especially like um, those that weren't just like the normal like male and female or like just any um, like those like non-binary um trans anything like that like i do hope like the efforts that i am putting in towards like the women and gender roles and like that research um i hope that i'm not doing it in a way that's disrespectful to them and i hope like it is honoring them i would never want to disrespect like anyone like in our community that feels that way um or like identifies like that or believes in that and so I hope um, by like talking about like the gender roles and then talking about the balance and then um, pulling like those primary sources about like the other genders um, that we had in our community, I hope that's uh, a way that I honored those that came before me. And I hope they're good with what I'm, how I'm portraying it. Do you have any more questions, Jim? So that would conclude our Q&A session um, of this presentation. So thank you, Tyra. That was really informative. You had a lot of great information in there. I think that this was definitely a wonderful kickoff to our winter lecture series. Um, if you would like to sit at table two, I think if anyone wants, when I end this session, it will kick everyone back to the social lounge that we were in before the Tyra's presentation started. And she will be at table two if you would like to speak to her on a more like personal or uh, what face to face level in a less uh, professional setting, then she will be at table two. And uh, I think we have enough seats at that table if everyone wants to join in. Uh, please join us next week. We will have our younger royalty, the uh, teen, junior, and little miss. They will also be speaking on cultural and language preservation and revitalization. So Thank you, everyone. Oh, and that one will take place at 3 as well. And uh, the room will open at 2.45, the same as it did today. So thank you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you next week. And I hope you participate in the rest of our lecture series, which will start again in January after next week's session. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Jim. Bye, Tyra. Bye.